the isotopes are important because potentially they could tell us whether that material, whether the elements are coming, are terrestrial or are extraterrestrial. The reason for that is that the solar system formed out of a condensing cloud of stuff. And, that, and the Earth specifically formed around elements that had certain isotopic, a certain isotopic composition. If something came from Alpha Centauri or from Andromeda, you would not expect it to have the, the, same, uh, the same isotopes. Isotopes are atoms with the same number of protons in the nucleus, but different numbers of neutrons. So from a physical standpoint, they behave pretty much the same way, um, but from a chemical st standpoint, they behave differently. And uh, there are 81 stable elements in the uh, elemental table. 275 isotopes are known and about 800 radioactive isotopes. Of course, the, the, the granddaddy of all that was uranium, you know, and uh, the, the work on isotope physics started during World War II to, uh, to develop radioactive isotopes that could be used to make an atom bomb. That's where the technology comes from. Some isotopes are natural and some are synthetic. And uh, the, the chemical properties of isotopes in a single element are nearly identical and the physical uh, characteristics are different. Uh, I'll give you just one, one example, which is, I mean, the simplest element is, um, is hydrogen. Hydrogen comes in three forms. Uh, hydrogen, the hydrogen we, we know and love, deuterium and tritium. And tritium is, is radioactive. Uh, as you can see, the, the, what differs between them is just the number of neutrons. So um, within our solar system, the isotopes and the isotope ratios within a given element are uh, generally the same. The, the difference, if, if we found, if we analyze something that comes from a crash, for example, and we find that the isotopes are radically different, or that the ratios among the isotopes are radically different, that is something where we have to pay attention. First, it would validate what the witnesses are saying. You couldn't say, well, you know, you just picked up an, an unusual stone or something, or a piece of slag. You would have to look at it, because it, it would not be, you know, the normal terrestrial metal. Um, and that's, that's really what I want to talk about. So let me go on and tell you what we've collected so far. There are uh, 15, of course there are many reports and many alleged things, but there are 15 cases that I've studied, some superficially, some to a great degree, with several colleagues that um, have to do with ejecting material. And that goes back to a case in 1897 in Aurora, Texas, where people described uh, a device uh, hitting a windmill and crashing, and allegedly there were uh, pieces of that object that were found. Uh, friends of ours within MUFON did a study in the 70s and 80s, and they believed that they found uh, some, of that, uh, some of that material. Then you have the Maury Island Puget Sound case, which has been generally dismissed by the scientific community and by the Air Force, by every, everybody else. And I'm not sure it should be dismissed. It was a case where, again, the disc was in trouble, it evolved in, in very erratic fashion, was stabilized by others, ejected material that looks like slag, and, and went away. Uh, if you remember from the literature, that case was fairly dramatic because it was, this, was, this happened at the time of the Kenneth Arnold sighting. A lot of people got excited. The Air Force went there, picked up some pieces, and their plane, the, the, the two Air Force officers died in a crash of their plane 
as they were taking the material back from, uh, from Puget Sound. So uh, those, those pieces are somewhere, and I certainly would love to take it to the lab. I, uh, I don't believe it was a hoax. I don't believe it was uh, just an ordinary uh, situation. I, I, it's just too similar to cases we have studied later uh, for us to dismiss the case. Um, there, was a, there were a number of cases that I'll talk about. As you can see here, there are four of these cases where we, have, we actually have the material. And I'll be spending most of my time talking about what we've done with that material. Um, there was an interesting case in 1952 over Washington. If you uh, remember in the literature, there was a wave of cases over the nation's capital that uh, in fact gave, uh, forced the government to, to do the first large study, um, which was done by the Air Force and by the, the Battelle Memorial Institute. And actually, uh, it was run by the CIA and the cover of the Air Force. Uh, during that, that wave, there were a number of um, objects, large numbers of objects seen uh, over the East Coast, chased by jets. Uh, one of the problems that that triggered was that there were so many cases that the teletype networks of the Air Force were saturated, and there was, uh, people were alarmed that an enemy, in that case the Soviet Union, could simulate a UFO wave over the US, saturate the communication networks of the Pentagon, and then attack uh, using, using that fact, the fact that the communication would be, uh, would be overwhelmed by reports of UFOs, which in that case would be false UFOs. Well, the UFOs in 1952 were not false, and there are a number of movies uh, and photographs and uh, interceptions by jets, and in one of these cases, a fragment detached itself and was, was uh, captured, was, was held. Uh, one, um, at, at one time, I, I met a, a high-level intelligence official who confirmed that to me, told me that had actually happened, and he knew the people who had done the study. But uh, that... The conclusion was, to, I never saw the detailed report, but the conclusion was that the material was a matrix of magnesium orthosilicate. In other words, a very strange uh, combination of different materials. And this is where magnesium comes up for the first time. And we'll be talking about magnesium uh, a little bit later. But it's a second-hand report. I don't have the material. Uh, very often, when we talk to scientists, they say, you know, as, as you may know, in the uh, uh, late uh, 90s, there was a, a meeting organized by Mr. Rockefeller, Lawrence Rockefeller, at the Rockefeller compound with Professor Sturak, uh, with whom I had worked at Stanford, and we had a committee of scientists, and we gathered a committee of ufologists who had done studies, and we went through a lot of this. But the scientists said, look, it's very interesting. If you could prove it, you know, I would spend time on it, but you haven't given me anything to take back to my lab. Okay? And that's really, the scientists are not close-minded. They are not as skeptical as you think they are. Certainly not where I am in Silicon Valley. People embrace anything that's new and exciting and can, can lead us beyond the frontier. But you have to give them something. And now we're getting to the point where we'll be close to be, being able to give them something. There was a case in December 54 in Campinas, Brazil. Uh, the analysis showed 90% tin with other elements. Obviously, second-hand report. We need to redo that kind of analysis. And then there was a case where we think the date is uh, 7 September 57. There is some controversy about the date happened on the beach in Ubatuba in Brazil. The witnesses were all local people. Um, a, a, a disc was flying over the beach and it went through a chaotic event and it exploded completely. 
where it exploded, it showered the trees, the clotheslines, the houses, the sand, and the sea with magnesium, pure magnesium. Um, this was picked up, um, and in particular, a call to the attention of a very good UFO researcher in Brazil, whom I had the privilege to meet, Dr. Olavo Fontes. And uh, when I met with Dr. Fontes, I asked him about the details of that. He confirmed those, what, what had happened. Uh, the uh, Brazilians had samples that came from different sources. People picked up those. They were sent to newspapers. They were sent to the Brazilian Air Force. And they confirmed that it was, there is no such thing as completely pure magnesium. For one thing, magnesium will ignite in contact with air, with the oxygen. So uh, when you have a piece of magnesium, it's coated in magnesium oxide. So by definition, you don't have 100% pure magnesium. But this came pretty close. But there were traces of other things in parts per million. The major one was calcium, and then strontium, and so on, silicon, manganese, and so on. And there were multiple analyses done in Brazil by uh, government labs and so on that confirmed the composition. So we, we trust that. We, we believe that the analysis was done pretty well. And the, uh, I will come back to the history of uh, that particular sample. There was a case in uh, Maumee, Ohio in 67 where a car collided with something and there was material found on the car. Material was 92% magnesium. This was after a UFO had gone over. There was something trailing. The, the car couldn't avoid the collision, and some of that material was found. So uh, I know the people who investigated the case, but I don't have the material. Uh, you have to realize that this is not, as a scientist, this is not something you're going to get by staying in your office or in your house, waiting for somebody to give it to you. You have to go out and get it. So you have to have the information. You have to validate the information. You have to go there. Then you have to gain the trust of the people. You have to, they have to trust you that you're not going to just steal it from them or keep it or destroy it, that you're not coming from the government to, to destroy the evidence. They have to believe that, and then, uh, in, in most cases, people will be very generous and will, be, will agree to cooperate in the research. So, and that's what I've been doing. It takes time, it takes traveling and so on. They reported speeding in 1956, right? Well, there are a number of, of other cases that I haven't listed. Uh, well, so this was on here. So, the, okay. L let me go on with that and take questions later. The, so, I, I was in South America, and uh, uh, people who had been involved in this particular case in uh, Colombia uh, gave me this piece. And so, you can see, these are, these are fairly sizable. I mean, this is not just a little bit of powder of something. These are actually, there is a lot of metal that's available when that kind of, of case happens. And uh, the reason there is a little piece missing is that we did an analysis at the University of Texas with Dr. Putoff, and we found that this was mostly aluminum, uh, almost 94% aluminum with, with uh, iron and, uh, and other things. Usually there are trace elements. Uh, uh, there was a um, sighting in Council Bluffs, Iowa, that is not in the UFO literature. And I don't understand why it's not in the, in the literature. Uh, let me just catch up with that. So this is a Washington case. Um, this is the uh, case in... in uh, Brazil, the case in um, Ubatuba, 
the case in Ohio, and um, the um, um, the case in Bogota. So, in in uh, let me stay on on for a minute on this case. In Bogota, what the, the people were students. Um, this was at night. An object became arrived was very unstable. It had been raining. Some discs came around the object, stabilized the object, and it ejected this material, which was aluminum, that fell in puddles of water. On the, in the, this was a parking lot, and they, that's where they picked it up. So the, um, the, the metal cooled down in, in the water. And uh, this is the, the case in Council Bluffs. Well, I'm amazed that, and, and uh, I spoke about that, that case at that Rockefeller conference in the 90s. I was amazed that uh, it's not in the UFO literature. Now you can say, well, maybe I should have written it up. But, um, I happen to know people who were there, people who investigated it that same evening when it happened. It happened on December 17. Uh, the, um, there were 11 witnesses. This was in the evening. They were in this park. Uh, Council Bluffs is a suburb of Omaha. Uh, they saw a, a red object that was hovering, and that object ej ejected a large amount of, me of metal that fell on the levee, and when it fell, it was still in fu fusion state. It was just dr dr dropping down that levee, gliding down the levee, and glowing red. Uh, there was a, uh, a policeman was on the site, took Polaroid pictures. I have the pictures. You see a mass of metal infusion. I mean, there is no, no question. So people were there right at that moment. 11 witnesses in different groups. They had seen that object in the sky, and they had seen that that metal being ejected. Uh, the police took um, testimony from people, and I have samples that come from the investigators, so there is a chain of custody. I, I know that there wasn't a man in black in the middle who stole the real thing and gave me the, the fake or something. Uh, I know where that the sample I have came from. And they, the major component was iron. Well, we have lots of iron on Earth. I mean, there is no. So, the time was uh, quarter to eight in the evening. Uh, we know everything about the situation, the, the, the visibility 10 miles, temperature freezing, wind was, you know, ordinary, and the metal was boiling down. The, and you can see the change the slide. You can, you can see that we have sizable chunks of that thing. So they thought uh, the investigation then proceeded in, in a way that was very well organized. They thought maybe it's a hoax, but if it's a hoax, where would you get that metal in fusion? I mean, you'd have to, to uh, get it from a factory somewhere or from a, a steel making facility. So there is one in, in the vicinity at Griffin Pipe. So they went to the manager, and we know the name of the manager. And he said, look, I mean, this is 2,500 degrees, OK? So you're not going to do that you know, as a, as a joke. Uh, you have to have a lot of equipment. Furthermore, they, um, they emptied their uh, furnaces at the end of the day, and at, you know, at 8 o'clock at night. That, that factory was idle and they had cleaned the furnaces. They, don't, they produce steel for their pipes. You know, they're not going to take an extra you know, few hundred pounds of uh, uh, you know, metal infusion and go dump it in, in a park from the sky. Okay? It's, not, it's not what they... So that hypothesis doesn't work. Well, maybe somebody could take a large amount of old metal and ignite it there, and then go hide in the bushes, and ha, ha, ha. You know, it's very funny. 
except that the analysis didn't show any evidence for thermite. And uh, also the, the ground was frozen to a depth of four inches. I mean, we know in that particular case, we know pretty much everything. We have all the environmental data. We know the witnesses. We know the, we have the pictures. We have all that. So they thought maybe it's something that fell from, um, from an aircraft. Well, yes, uh, there is uh, Epley Airfield 10 minutes away and off of the Air Force Base. But there was no abnormal aircraft activity at the time. The airport was closed. Uh, they had no, no landing, at least they had no landing at the time. And um, this was at something like 2,500 feet, so uh, the, the metal wouldn't be warmed up uh, by, by falling and certainly wouldn't arrive in a fusion state to the ground. I mean, you, if you're going to talk to scientists, you have to go through all that. You know, they, you have to just look at all the things it could be. But, you know, even B-52s don't fly around with steel furnaces, you know. So it didn't come from, from an aircraft. Well, maybe it came from space. Uh, so they called the Air Force Space Command and they said, do you ever, you know, send metal infusion from satellites? And uh, the Air Force said the debris is not molten when it hits the ground through the atmosphere. Uh, there was no indentation left. So this is not something that fell with a, a lot of energy. And the, the visual sighting where they could see the debris coming from was only about 600 feet high and it wouldn't be glowing and there was no structure at all in the debris. And uh, for the same reason, um, it's not a meteorite. It doesn't have the composition of a meteorite, low nickel. So um, what's changed, and the, the reason I'm now excited to pick up that study from the people who've come before and have done these uh, composition analyses, is that the technology for analysis has evolved enormously, and especially where I am in Silicon Valley. And um, we have access to devices that can, can look at the isotopes. And uh, I'm lucky enough to have access essentially free to, uh, to these devices. And one device isn't going to give you necessarily an answer that you can trust. But if you, uh, if you have access to uh, several devices, then you can, you can begin to look carefully. And here we've looked at, in the Council Bluffs case, we've started, this is work in progress, so we don't have conclusions yet uh, at, from, for every case, but we've started to look at the iron and chromium, and we found that they were, in that particular sample, they are at normal terrestrial level. Now we have to go on and look at the, the rest of the uh, elements that are composing that. Uh, the composition, though, is not the composition you'd expect from ordinary slag. So again, we're not, this is not an industrial product. This is something else. So this is a kind of thing we're going to continue to do. That, uh, type of analysis would have been dif very difficult to do and very costly to do 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago. But uh, now it's becoming possible and that's why, that's why I'm here. I have ulterior motives, as I said. Let's go back to Ubatuba because Ubatuba has a fascinating history. Uh, we have the full history of the samples. There, were, there wasn't a lot of material uh, one sample was turned over to the Air Force and the Air Force blew it up. So they said, oh, we're sorry. Uh, some of that material came from Brazil to a group in Arizona called APRO with two very good researchers, Jim and Coral Lorenzen, uh, who um, uh, were in contact with several, several laboratories and one of them was an Air Force laboratory that was very interested in the case. And they, they said, well, uh, unfortunately, 
we put it in our instrument and it, uh, we sort of destroyed it. So uh, do you have another sample you can send us? And they said, well, we, we don't think it's really a good idea. So the other samples they sent to Stanford University, again to Professor Sturrock, with, with whom I was working at the time. And one of the strange things about that, um, that material was that the density uh, of uh, at least one of the samples was, was very unusual. And the, the density was much higher than it should have been and corresponded to what the density would be if only one of the isotopes was present. In other words, if it was only that particular isotope of magnesium that was present in that piece of metal, which uh, of course is from a natural point of view is impossible. So that would mean that uh, that, that material if we can confirm that, that that material was engineered and that it, it wasn't just ordinary uh, magnesium. Um, by the way, to, to do that would be extraordinarily expensive, especially in 1957, when the, all the isotope separation was done for nuclear bombs, for nuclear devices. And there wasn't much in terms of... Uh, uh, isotopic physics for industry or any, anything else. Um, one of the samples, of Professor Sturrock had a number of samples from different cases that he kept in a bagged vault because there is a long history of things disappearing in this field. Uh, as, you, as you know, uh, and some of the paranoia is completely justified. So if you have a sample like that, you want to take care of it. Uh, and uh, the, he got a phone call at Stanford University from the director of the bank saying, uh, Professor Sturrock, can you spare a few moments and come over so I can show you something? And he went to the bank and the director took him into the vault in Palo Alto and the, that drawer was open. The door was open and the drawer was empty. Which means that somebody from outside the bank had the ability to go into the vault and had the two keys to open that particular drawer and left the door open just to make a statement. So I think this is what we're up against. And you know, speculation about who that would be is completely open. I think if, if it's a government, I mean, they could have requested to borrow that sample for two weeks from Stanford and Peter Sturrock would have said, sure. I mean, so why go to that trouble of finding the way to get into the bank, into the vault, opening that and stealing that material? That's absurd. It's, it's completely absurd. But that's something we're up against. So we are guarding that material pretty carefully and uh, preserving a chain of evidence. So this is a, a letter of transmittal from Professor Sturak, who is now retired, uh, when he gave me four of the remaining samples from Ubatuba. And there is very, very little of that material left because it has been studied in different places including in, in France, where the azotope ratios were measured. And, um, but it's a very minute amount of material. And then, uh, last, a few months ago, I was in Argentina studying other cases. And I, I was there for about 10 days. And one of the places I went to was a UFO museum in Victoria, which is in Entre Rios, which is about four hours north of um, uh, Buenos Aires. And in that museum, we had a good time talking about UFOs and looking at their collections. I brought them some, some material and so on. But I looked at uh, one of the windows. They had two large samples from Ubatuba. One came directly, had come to Argentina from Dr. Fontes, and the other one had been given to them by um, a man named Hercente, 
And uh, I said, well, would it, would it bother you if uh, I took, you know, a few shavings from these two uh, samples? There is a large amount of material there. So, and again, I, I try to preserve a chain of custody so you can, you know, nobody's going to say, well, that, you know, Valet is making this, this stuff up and these people don't exist and so on. So I take pictures everywhere and, and uh, I, have, I have witnesses. So I can, I can trace everything back. Um, so uh, last September, we were in Buenos Aires and I got these, uh, these samples and kept them, you know, in my pocket all the way back to San Francisco. And then, you know, back to the lab. So um, we've preserved, you know, a number of these samples. And now we're starting to look at them very, you know, very carefully. And again, sometimes the witnesses will say, well, you know, how come you don't have the results yet? You know, but you put it in your machine, you push a button and it will tell you. Well, it's not that simple. For one thing, we have to have, you know, every hypothesis about that material has to be open. I mean, it's not like checking, you know, some industrial thing you get from General Motors where you approximately know what it is and what the purpose is. We don't know what those things are. So we have to be able to preserve, really preserve everything and to do it several times, several different conditions on several machines. Uh, this is um, the next generation mass spectrographer that uh, machine we have access to, uh, free. And uh, we, we know we're part of the team that's working with that machine. So uh, that's one of the systems that, we are, that we're using. Um, the previous generation looked like this. And it was, this is a large, I mean, it occupies most of a, a large room. It's a $7 million machine that it doesn't work quite in the same way as the previous one. It doesn't give you composition as well, but it's, it will give you the, um, the, the isotopes. And the way you get to the isotopes, and again, I'm not going to give you a, you know, a physics lecture, but essentially you bombard the material with, with ions that will force a secondary emission from what, whatever is in that material. And then you, you take these secondary ions, you put them in magnetic field, in electromagnetic fields, to look at the time of flight, which depends on the mass. And that's how you can uh, essentially spread them a, a, along a spectrum and, and get the, the actual composition. So, so we went back to what I had brought back from Argentina first. I mean, we're going to do everything with both of those machines. But I want to show you what we've done so far. So what they called uh, Muestra A, the you know, first sample, is essentially at the natural level. You see um, the isotope 24, 25, and 26 are very close. The values we measured were very close to the normal terrestrial values. The, the second one, though, was very different. And here we're getting into uh, something that's quite interesting. For example, magnesium 26, we measure at 17%, 20% in the di two different runs we did. In a normal magnesium, it should be 11%. Same thing with magnesium 25 and so on. So. Uh, the, the ratios are significantly different from terrestrial magnesium. Remember where this came from. Uh, this came from a disc over a beach. There were fishermen there. There were a few tourists. Ubatuba isn't a big town, but people were there on holiday and so on. This disc came over, blew up completely, showered you know, the, the beach, the water. and the, So depending on where our sample comes from, it is combined with sodium, which comes from the ocean. It is combined with, uh, you know, components from sand, 
and uh, it's more or less pure if it just fell on, on the ground. So we have to take all that into account. So far, the composition, the fact that we find uh, uh, that we find sodium and other things really reassures us because it verifies what the witnesses were saying. I mean, at this point, they can't lie. I mean, we're going to find whatever is in there, the silicium from the sand, if it fell in the sand, the sodium from the sea, if it fell in the ocean, and so on. So uh, now, we're, now we're talking about something where we can validate what the witnesses have said. Remember, in that particular case, we don't really have a complete chain of custody. We, we don't have access to the uh, initial witnesses. You know, this came, came up a long time ago in a country far, far away. So uh, we, we have to, but we, we don't have to guess because we can look at the isotopes. Um, the, uh, the literature just on that um, sample is already pretty large. And uh, there have been a number of uh, papers written by Professor Sturak, uh, by others, by people from different UFO groups who've had access to it. I want to mention one last case. I, want, I, I, I cannot say where it came from um, because we're still researching the background and everything else. And so I, I've called it Sierra, which is really a code word. But it's very interesting because it has titanium and iron in it. Um, and when we looked at the uh, titanium, we found significant differences, and uh, especially with titanium-49, uh, which would be normally 5.4%, 5, 5 we find something close to 7%, the 6.3 and 6.7. The iron one we haven't done yet, and so this is again what the, the kind of work we're currently engaged in doing. And so my ulterior motive is that if you or groups that you're associated with have heard of cases similar to this, where we can go to the site or we can uh, meet the people who have custody of the material, we don't need a lot of it. We don't need all of it. We just need just a, a few slivers of whatever they have. Uh, and they will be happy to have them look at the experiment, come over and, you know, sit down with us through the experiment. Again, this will be completely transparent. What we want is the final data. And we don't want anybody to come back later and say, well, maybe you substituted something for something else. I mean, we, there is absolutely no reason to play the games that the government has been playing with that stuff for the last 60 years. It's stupid. Okay? We're a long, long way from understanding what we could do with this. And if there are people around who think, well, I'm going to understand this and I'm going to have a patent that will give me billions of dollars, they are, they are dreaming. The material, these, you know, this looked like just strange numbers and strange ratios. But what those ratios are telling us is, is, uh, oops. Well, I lost, the, I lost the last slide, but that's, that's okay. I can tell you what it says. Um, the, the place where we are now is that what, what we have already in those analyses we've done, especially in the two that I've mentioned, is material that contains trace levels of elements and isotopes that no man-made or terrestrial metals would be expected to show, okay? Already with the preliminary stuff that we've done. Thank you, guys. The, we need to continue the analysis building on what we've learned and what we've learned from the people who came before us, who again did the good work with the instruments they had, and we need to keep pushing that. This is again, this is Silicon Valley stuff, okay? You take 
the, the best work and then you push it beyond the frontier. Um, and we need to do it, get to the next decimal place and especially look at the, uh, look at, uh, the isotopes. We need more samples. We know there are more samples out there from the folklore and from the literature. But what is it going to tell us? Well, I thought, when I started this with my colleagues, I thought what we're going to find is that there are ratios that are different from the Earth, so we'll be able to prove that these objects, whatever they are, uh, come from our extraterrestrial. I mean, that's, that's uh, the proof of the pudding. The problem is that the distortion we find are so large that this is not, this is not what we're proving. What we're proving in some of that material, that this was engineered purposely by somebody or something, either on Earth or off-world, who had the ability to separate the isotopes and recombine them in different ratios. Now, in, we couldn't do that today. I mean, it would, it would cost trillions of dollars. Unless somebody has an absolutely magical technology to do that. I mean, this is, it's, you can see how difficult it is just to get to the composition with precision. Now you'd have to take this through a separation of isotope factory, essentially, recreate, separate the isotopes and recombine them in ratios that are not natural ratios. So they are not natural ratios on Earth, but they are not natural ratios in the solar system, and they are not natural ratios in Andromeda, okay? So that's what we are coming up with, and that's where, that's where we are. Essentially, we've, we're, we've bumped against this, this wall. And so it's not just trying to prove that UFOs are extraterrestrial, which would be relatively easy to do with the instruments we have now, but it's really documenting what has been done to that material to get it to this. So if anybody knows about, you know, things that we can look at, you know, we're open for business. Thank you. Thank you, Jacques Vallée. Where, where are we running our time? Do you want questions? We have a few minutes for questions, so we're gonna go to some quick questions. We have some questions over here, and I'll just turn it over to you right there, sir. We need a handheld, get him a mic. You can come to this mic if you like. Check, check. Yeah, I have a question, and I guess this falls under the theoretical part. It seems to me that anything that would fall off of a UFO would unlikely be like a tailpipe or a cigarette lighter or something like that. It would be most likely some kind of a waste product or a byproduct of the propulsion system rather than, you know, some piece of the hull or something like that. What are, what are your thoughts about that? So, um, the first time I went through this was about 20 years ago and I published a couple of papers about that which nobody looked at, by the way, I mean, you know, <laughs> this community, as you know, is much more interested in speculation yes. and things like that than, than really looking at the stuff, which is, which is fine, but, I, you know, to the extent we have stuff to look at, we should look at it. And I found a number of papers and patents about rotating systems uh, with liquid metal for energy transmission for electrical, uh, electrical machines. Those are very large. They are, you know, sort of a round thing with mercury, for example, or with liquid, you know, uh, liquid metal, conducting liquid metal. Um, so presumably you wouldn't use magnesium. <laughs> but uh, those machines have been made. Now, I don't know that anything like that has been made to fly because of course, that would be a pretty, you know, 
pretty uh, heavy piece of machinery. Uh, maybe somebody has and hasn't taken a patent on it. If they've discovered anti-gravity with liquid metal, you know, uh, more power to them, literally. But, um, I, you know, that seems very unlikely. So you, you could speculate that UFOs use some sort of rotating liquid metal thing and that they would, from time to time, need to eject it when they, are be when they become unstable. But, you know, the composition we find you know, why would it turn into slag? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. The, the metals would be, you would use. Yes, you, you lost your mic, I guess. Uh, battery down. <coughs> Well, because, you know, again, a 1% difference wouldn't... You're not just looking at the, the isotope. You're looking at the ratios among the different isotopes. And in some cases, it differs by 100%. You, could, you couldn't do that. The question I had was, uh, how do we know what the ratios are, like you said, in Andromeda? Uh, we haven't been there, but uh, how do you know that, the, that, it's, that it's not different in some other galaxy or something like that? So, um, one of the machines that I showed here is used by geologists who are interested in uh, meteorites. You know, we have bits of meteorites, we have bits of comets, we have bits of things that are extraterrestrial. And there are scientists who study extraterrestrial material all day long, you know, and they do, they get their PhD looking at, you know, uh, isotope ratios in meteorites. And those come from the other end of the solar system. So we know uh, the, the ratios may be a little bit different, but they are not different by 100%, you know, like, like this material. And um, the, essentially, so far, what this material seems to be telling us is that this has been engineered, the, the isotope ratios have been re-engineered, and so I, I haven't gone to Andromeda. We don't have any material from Andromeda. But, you know, the, the, the neighborhood, the cosmic neighborhood, was formed out of pretty much the same processes. I mean, you know, hydrogen turns into helium. The star starts, you know, uh, radiating, and it radiates in certain ways. Uh, yes, there could be abnormal things. But, uh, uh, but if you find something that has ratios like one-third, 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 you know, of three different isotopes, somebody has made that. And so the next question that we're going to start attacking is how much would it cost with today's, you know, isotope separation technology, which has been pushed forward by the nuclear people and by other people, uh, how much would it cost to, to do one cubic centimeter of that stuff? So far, you get to trillions of dollars. So, if we if we need the uh, you know the the product of the United States to make one cubic centimeter, may, maybe there's something wrong somewhere. So either there is a something in physics that we just don't understand at all that somebody has discovered, which is way out, uh, or we're dealing with a technology that's completely foreign to what we've got so far. So that's where we are. Yes, Hi. Um, it was related to the first question, and I was wondering um, if magnesium might still be used as a fuel, so fuel source, and if yes, um, by that logic, could some of the other Group 2 metals um, be used, the more reactive ones, to um, a greater effect? Well, if it could be. Uh, that's obviously one of the things to look at. You know, is it, is it fuel, is it part of a propulsion, is it part of... But again, when you look at that material, that material has to come from somewhere, and it would have to have the right, you know, isotope ratios. Uh, so, 
Um, but it, you know, one of the ideas would be uh, that if somebody has discovered anti-gravity, that to have an anti-gravity propulsion system, you have to have a specific, uh, specific isotope ratios, and that would provide the motivation to spend the money to actually, you know, change those ratios. But we couldn't do that. So again, this is not something where we're all going to become rich because we found this and we can file a patent on, you know, and suddenly, uh, you know, fly to Andromeda. Um, we don't, we're not at the point where we can understand that, no. Uh, and presumably it would be a more environmentally friendly fuel source as well. It would be what? It would be more environmentally friendly, like as a fuel, so as a fuel source, if it just, you know, if you just had well, hydrogen. Well, this is not, a... none of this is very friendly in terms of the environment. <laughs> I mean, so, yes, if you could control it, certainly if, if you could achieve anti-gravity, for example, and, and, and control it, uh, that would, you could do away with, you know, gasoline and everything else. Um, but uh, right now we don't, we don't see how we can do that in a vehicle, you know, certainly not in a, in a, you know, uh, in a craft, in a spacecraft. So that's what, you know, what we're dealing with. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was uh, in charge of the state of Hawaii UFO investigation for almost 50 years, and I've been reading your books, you know, <laughs> longer than that probably. And um, but basically, there were small cases I wanted to ask about. I had agents all over the world, and especially, you know, since you're from Europe, <clears throat> um, there's a two pieces of metal I want to find out about, okay? And I'm sure you, you remember all the cases of angel here. They, people would see UFOs all over the world, and this strange stuff would, would come out of and land on the ground, but as soon as you picked it up, it would dissolve. Do you know anything about that? Um, I, don't, I don't know about that. I have not had a chance to do any analysis of that. I've heard. Yeah, because people so were unable to because it would fall out. As soon as you picked it up, it would dissolve right in your hands. Yes. Yeah, yes, many, yes. many people tried to pick it up. And that's, that's what happened. Yes, yes, yes. I certainly heard that. There, I think in the literature, you'd find a few cases where that was analyzed, where they, somebody had the good sense of putting it into a glass jar. Oh you know, and clo closed the jar and uh, took it to a lab. And I, I don't remember what they found. Now, the other case, I'm sure, being from where you're from over there, and you should know about this case, it's really famous, the Billy Meyer case. Um, <clears throat> I don't know whether to believe it or not, but he claimed that a spacecraft landed from, from, in Switzerland from the Pleiades, and the pilot gave him a, a piece of metal. And he's got a video and he's got a book where he shows a close-up photo of the metal. And he said that he gave it to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and they analyzed it, and he said that a guy named Marcel Vogel analyzed it, a scientist. I knew, I knew uh, Marcel Vogel. Yeah, he said that man analyzed it too. Do you know if this was proven to be a real milk? So he claimed that it was an unknown alloy that they had never seen before. So I, I knew Marcel Vogel. Uh, Marcel Vogel is one of the, my unsung heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, he was an engineer at uh, IBM Labs, mm -hmm. and he invented the magnetic coating for disks, oh. which put out of business all the previous companies before IBM. <laughs> because <laughs> you, you, you probably remember, if you're old enough, <coughs> those big disks that went into, you know, the whole generation of IBM machines that uh, replaced the punch cards and all the stuff that they had before. Marcel Vogel invented that. Yeah. When I met him, he was, uh, he was made a super, you know, retired engineer, at, and he had any lab he wanted at IBM. Mm -hmm. And when I met him, he was studying uh, plants, oh. you know, how uh, plants could communicate with uh, signals and so on. That was the secret <laughs> life of plants. <laughs> He was involved in yeah. that. He was an extraordinary creative uh, engineer uh -huh. and a pillar of Silicon Valley and so on. So when I met him, we discussed all this, and he said that it was, he had looked at it, and that um, it was an alloy, but it was a combination of, if I understand it, of, of uh, plastics and metal 
you know, in, in ways that where you really couldn't uh, understand the function. <clears throat> well, do you think this was proof of the Billy Meyer case? It's just very controversial. The what? Do you think this was proof of the Billy Meyer uh, UFO landing uh, because um, um, he was trying to use that for evidence? No, there, there are other things wrong with uh, Billy Meyer, I think. <laughs> I, I went to his place and... No, <laughs> Okay, just one other thing. I'd like to meet with you privately later because um, uh, I read Passport to Magoni. That's one of my favorite books I've ever read. And about the folklore, you know, all the creatures which resemble yes. modern UFO things, all yes. through folk history, Celtic, I mean, all over the world. Well, we have creatures called Manahunis, which they try to tell you yes. are, are mythical, but they're not. They're, there's been a lot of Hawaiians. I've talked to people from Hawaiian royalty that have physically seen them. And I've also talked to people from the University of Hawaii that are pure Hawaiians, like um, Professor Inesh Ashdown that said that she actually, um, there was a big uh, meeting of Hawaiians, Royal Hawaiian lineage over on the island of Hawaii, and they were chanting, and they saw a reptilian there, you know, that came out of the pond, you know, um, you have physical and blood reptilian, and they've seen Manahunis, and I've, I've interviewed um, Two of my friends were hiking in a remote forest on Maui, and they saw, saw these little Manahunis. They're real. And they look like a lot of UFO occupants. But I just, um, so sometimes, I, I can't tell you all this here, obviously. There's a lack of time, but I'd like to talk yeah, to you about Yeah, we just have sometime. time for a couple more anyway, so. And I recommend everybody get that book. You know, you can probably still get it off the internet. It's Passport to Magoni. It's incredible. Yeah, you're not, you're not going to read this stuff in most UFO books. And Magonia. Ma yeah, Magonia. H U N I. Yeah, you're not going to read this in most UFO books. It's a lot of original research. It's fantastic. Yeah, let's just do one more question before we wrap up. Well, I'm sorry if I'm asking you to repeat yourself here. Um, I'm curious if these uh, isotomic, these metals with these isotomic anomalies, have any practical purpose that more typical metals can't perform. Um, we're, we're not at that point yet. I mean, we, you could imagine that. You know, if they came from the skin of the object, you could think that uh, maybe they have some special radiation properties and so on, just right. like, you know, the stealth aircraft. So we have no need for these we, anomalies well, we, today. You know, it's only the stealth bomber oh, yeah. has spe special skin, you know. Um, the, uh, but that's, that's not what it is. I mean, um, we can't get to the structure because it was fused. Right. So we don't, we don't see the structure in those particular cases. There may be other samples where we will be able to look at the structure. Uh, right. So it's very difficult to get to the function. My, my last bit is, uh, are you looking at only metals? Or are you also looking at other ejecta? Anything. Anything? Yeah, any, okay. any element. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah. We'll stay away from the radioactive ones. Oh, what's that? <laughs> We'll stay away from the radioactive ones. Oh. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I, I, we have to cut it at that. And, no, okay. Um, we, Jacques I had one Blake, question, though. Uh, a, it, one last question. In, in, in the samples you had, did you study the crystalline structure, or is it because they're best to be made? We're going to tow cars away that are parked back behind the street. It was destroyed by, I mean, they, all of them went through a very, uh, you know, chaotic process. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you have, give a round of applause for Jacques Leg. Thank you.